Britain's in the grip of an epidemic. A third of our children are now overweight or obese, and thousands have such bad diets that they're having to undergo major surgery. It can be prevented 100%. As a society, we have become accepting of it, and we shouldn't be. We should say, this is wrong. Correct. This is wrong. Obesity is a major problem, and I'm tired of grifters who constantly say, think of the children, while ignoring the catastrophic effect that things like saying, health at every size, is having on many impressionable kids who now aren't paying attention to their health. And it also enables hedonistic ideologies like this. I like to just have an easy life. I think everybody likes an easy life. Or we get more people who are stuck not knowing what to do, because the body positivity grifters are drowning out all the people who are actually knowledgeable about how to resolve these situations by calling everything hate speech or fat phobic. I would rather she didn't have any fizzy drinks, but that's easier said than done with a kid. The answer to this is really simple. Just don't pay for it. What's she going to do? She doesn't have a job. I'm not sure if these parents know this or not, but kids can't afford anything. So if you don't buy it, they can't eat it. It's really that easy if you don't want a kid with a weight problem. I think the parents are to blame for overweight children, but they have to be helped. Right. The parents are the ones who buy the food, the parents are the ones who set the boundaries, and the parents are the ones who teach their kids most of their behaviors. What I don't like is all of the avoidance of how important proper parenting is to these issues, while instead, the mainstream narrative is to just start lying to people by saying being massively overweight is healthy. Like this 2021 article from Cosmo about body positivity that says, This is healthy with Jessamine Stanley. Uh, no it's not. And what I don't get is that if they really want to talk about body positivity, then why isn't this person who has an actual disability and has actually accomplished something the first person we see? Why do I have to scroll way down in the article to find this woman? Or what about this person in a wheelchair? Why isn't she the first woman we see? Isn't body positivity supposed to be about people who are a victim to unfortunate situations? Why is Callie Thorpe, a person whose bad habits put her in that shape, the first person we see? This is not healthy. This is a high risk of heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And you know what the real problem is? It's that all this stuff is trickling down to children. A third of our children are now overweight or obese. It's very rare to see fat children with thin parents. One third of kids in the UK are overweight or obese? That's crazy. And it's not any better in America either. Look at these CDC numbers for obesity. 20%, which is similar to current obesity numbers in the UK. That's one in five kids who are obese, which in terms of America has increased from around one in seven nationwide since 2005. That's a massive increase. This has very real health consequences to children. And one of the sadder things that is pointed out in this documentary is just how many kids have teeth that are rotten because of their poor eating habits. Let's get into it, but first, let me tell you about today's sponsor, Ground News. Ground News is the world's first news comparison platform with the goal of making all news more honest and transparent. Every day, the website compares thousands of news articles across the political spectrum to help you get the least biased and most informed experience of current events. Each article is rated on the bias of the news source and how factual or honest that news source is overall. Also, the owner of the news organization is displayed so that you know who you're getting your information from. Ground News's mission statement is to decrease political polarization, help get rid of echo chambers, and increase media literacy in the general population so that people are more difficult to manipulate. My favorite Ground News tool is the Blind Spotter. The Blind Spotter allows you to type in the Twitter handle of the creators that you watch and check to see what their political bias is based on who they follow and who they interact with. This tool allows you to see who is more balanced in their political interactions and who is more on the extremes. You can also sign up to check your own news bias, which can help you balance out your information diet. Check out Ground News and the Ground News Blind Spotter by clicking on the links in the description. All right, these clips come from a British documentary called Junk Food Kids that was released in 2015. It covers somewhere around eight children, but we're only going to focus on two children because their stories have the best lessons in them. The first one is four-year-old Tallulah. One of the patients at the Leeds Hospital is four-year-old Tallulah, who lives with her mum, Natalie. What are you then? She's about to start school, but it's hard to find a uniform that will fit. This is so sad because you know Tallulah is going to get bullied because of her parents' screw-up. She's only four, so it's not her fault she's overweight. The second kid is 13-year-old Pavia. At 19 stone, Pavia's case is serious, so she's being seen by Dr. Mushtak, who runs the clinic. 
For those of you who aren't British, one stone is 14 pounds, so that's 266 pounds at 13 years old. Personally, if I was this girl's parent, I would be absolutely flipping out and doing everything I could to fix this problem. Outside of Pavia's situation, the sad thing is that in this documentary, it really seems like a lot of the parents just don't care. Speaking of, here's Tallulah's mom. Yeah, eight to nine years. We'll have a try of this one. You got this? It's a bit tight. I think even that might be a push to Lula. Last couple of years, she's piled loads of weight on. But I'll have to get a bigger size. Adults that I know have said that she's fat. It absolutely heart-wrenched me. It can't really be all that heart-wrenching because you're laughing when your four-year-old child can't fit into a uniform that's for nine-year-olds. But I'll have to get a bigger size. So I don't really think Tallulah's mom, Natalie, is all that serious about this particularly considering that Tallulah's weight is not her only problem. She actually has a much more severe problem with her dental hygiene because several of her teeth have gone completely rotten and she is in constant pain because of it. What's worse is that this is actually not that uncommon of a problem in the UK. Here's a doctor saying how many teeth he's seen being removed. Yeah, I'd say it's, it's probably in excess of 7,000 teeth. It might even be approaching 10,000 teeth a year. I believe that's just at the clinic he works at. Now, I'm not going to show any of it because it was traumatizing to watch, but honestly, I have no idea how these doctors can do these surgeries and not lose their minds. This is definitely not something I could do for a living, particularly when they have to watch the kids wake up in pain because of something their parents did. I would be screaming at the parents for allowing this to happen to their kids, especially someone like this dad who has already watched his daughter lose her teeth and is now about to watch his son lose his teeth due to eating too much sugary junk food. And then he's like, Hey, after the surgery, let's feed him the same food that just causes teeth to rot. It's 7am, and in a few hours, four-year-old Adam will have surgery to remove his decayed baby teeth. He has been in a lot of pain. Be all right after a few hours. Let's give him a few sweets and take his mind off it. I don't think these parents actually care about their kids, and that's why this stuff happens. Sure, they'll say they care about their kids when they're around other people or they're in front of a camera, but when you look at the fruits of their labor, you can see the truth. Parents can lie, but kids never lie. You can always see the reality of a situation by looking at the kids. Or you can see the truth in situations like this. Tallulah has problems with her teeth, and she, at four years old, has chronic pain because she has abscesses in her gums. Despite her daughter being in pain, Natalie misses Tallulah's dental appointment by a pretty significant margin. Today, Natalie has to take Tallulah to see the hygienist. It's an appointment they have to attend before the hospital will see Tallulah. But it starts in 10 minutes, and it's eight miles away. We've woke up late, well, it's 25 past. I have to be there at half past, and it'll take me for about half an hour on bus. You can say this is heart-wrenching all you want, but when your daughter is in pain and you miss her doctor's appointment because you're irresponsible, I don't believe you actually care. Because people who care are willing to deal with the inconvenience of making sure they wake up on time. Natalie clearly does not want to be a parent. So as she got older, it went from formula to cow's milk to juice. Now, I know that's my fault, but it was easier for me on a night to give her a bottle of juice than to try and sit up with her all night and try and get her back to sleep. Well, at least she takes some responsibility here by saying that maybe she shouldn't have done that. But what it really comes down to is that Natalie wants everything to be easy and doesn't want to work hard, which is why all these bad things keep happening. It's really astounding to watch how little Natalie is willing to sacrifice for her children. I like to just have an easy life. I think everybody likes an easy life. I think a lot of people desire an easy life, but the people who sit down on the couch all day and watch TV are never happy. The happy people are the ones who go out, do stuff, and get stuff done. Happiness requires work. Also, pro tip on that clip before the last one. Fruit juice is not healthy for you. You can look at the sugar content. Most of the popular fruit juices have so much processed sugar in them that it's basically a soda without the carbonation. If you want to be healthy, your main drink should be water. That being said, let's talk about what Natalie feeds her kids. This is what Tallulah eats for a dinner, and holy crap, that is basically as much as I eat for a meal, and I am at least three times her size. We have a large baked potato loaded with chicken and baked beans. That is a ton of food for a four-year-old, and remember, this is a single meal. This girl is likely having three meals of this size every day, plus snacks. Her brother has a similarly oversized meal as well. 
Remember, Natalie says she cares about her kids. Did she take the time to investigate what a proper portion size is for a four-year-old? It doesn't seem like it. Natalie seems more content to blame her lack of effort on genetics. I cannot see a problem with everything that I give it. I honestly do not believe she's put all this weight on just through what she eats. Thyroid. Thyroid, so so it might be something to do with that. The editors of this are hilarious. They show this little girl eating a massive meal, followed by her mom saying, I don't think there's anything wrong with what she eats. You know they did that on purpose. For one, thyroid problems are rare, and two, it's actually pretty easy to test for thyroid issues. It's a blood test and an ultrasound that both take no more than a few minutes and cost very little. This stuff is not that hard to investigate. So is it really a thyroid issue, or are you just using that as an excuse? Oh, and I'm sure the problem with her daughter's teeth is also because of her thyroid, right? That one hurts me. That one hurts me. That one hurts me. That one hurts me. All of them hurt me. I don't know how Natalie could do this to her kid. Tallulah is complaining that her teeth hurt, and yet Natalie misses the appointment, which resulted in her daughter having to deal with the pain for an additional month before she got to see a doctor, and then Natalie has the audacity to say, well, it's not anything I'm doing, it's genetics. Again, it's really shocking to see how much suffering people will cause themselves, and more importantly, other people, simply because they don't want to put in a little work. And I'm not being hyperbolic here. This is a really prevalent problem. Tons of people do bad things simply because they don't want to work hard and simply because they don't have discipline. i got to get him something to eat quickly just for while we're going around so they don't whinge and moan at me. Yeah, you're getting one of those. Soy sauce. And soy sauce. What's in that again? Cheese and onion. I reckon it's got a bit of mayonnaise in it or something as well. Wait, did she pay for that stuff? Is she one of those people who, like, eats the food in the store before paying? Does she have any ability to delay gratification at all? She's certainly teaching her kids not to be able to wait. I'm going to buy them food to eat in the store so they don't bother me while I'm shopping. You do know the reason they complain about not being able to snack on food in the store is because you haven't taught them self-discipline, right? You are literally making the problem worse by constantly appeasing them every time they complain. Jeez, she's as bad as a parent who raises their kid with an iPad. Her kids are full-blown addicts. Her whole modus operandi is... I don't want to have to do anything stressful by dealing with any negativity from my kids, so I'm just going to let them grow up with a myriad of health problems. It's really gross to see how lazy this mother is. And also, she comes off like this is all a joke. She thinks this stuff is funny. I always try, like every night, every tea time, to cook a proper home cooked meal. Do you use kind of convenience stuff? Though? How much of it would you say? You... About 90%. 90% convenience? Yeah. Why is that? Because it's convenient. And they want feeding now. They wanted feeding yesterday, not not in a two hours' time. Notice how they showed Natalie's son drinking juice, which basically says that she's not actually remorseful about damaging her daughter's teeth in the past by giving her that kind of drink. But great. What does her constantly buying convenience foods teach her kids? It teaches them to not be able to wait for things. It gives them zero ability to deal with suffering or struggle, and that's going to cause them all sorts of problems when they grow up. They certainly aren't going to learn how to cook, and outside of having poor health, it will prevent them from getting a job. Job training requires lots of patience, hard work, and discipline, of which they'll have none of because their mom didn't teach it to them as children. So they'll be massively disadvantaged, and if they want success, then they'll have to learn that stuff as an adult, which will cost them years of their lives. Or they'll just become welfare flunkies, which is a lot more likely. They'll also have trouble making good friends because laziness and whining aren't seen as attractive personality traits. Doing stuff like this will make it very hard for Natalie's kids to make friends. You're both not getting no chocolate, no sweets, no nothing. Sometimes I think to myself, no, I shouldn't give in. You're not having Kinder Eggs. But I do. Go and get a Kinder Egg each, quickly. I get a lot of messages from viewers, and after all the people who have told me they don't have friends, stuff like this makes my head spin. Now Natalie is stuck with those kids, so the crying and complaining works. When they try that stuff with friends, the friends are just going to stop talking to them, and they won't be able to make new ones. It's all just sad, because I know lots of kids are raised in similar situations, and this is a part of the reason why they can't keep people around them when they get older. So Tallulah's story ends with dental surgery that, again, I'm not going to show because it was very hard to watch. 
Her mom Natalie says I'll try harder now after seeing the surgery, which I don't really believe because it's one thing to say that you'll try, but it's another thing to actually put in the effort. There's no evidence that Natalie has the ability to work hard or was moving in that direction by the end of the documentary. Now the second story has quite a bit more hope than Tallulah's story, because unlike Tallulah, it seems that Pavia's mom actually cares about her and is trying, but simply doesn't know what to do. Here's Pavia's mom, Claire. Five miles outside Leeds, 13-year-old Pavia has brought some friends home for tea. Her mum Claire knows her daughter's weight is getting out of control. The last two years has been the worst. I know she's put on... She's put on four and a half stone this last year. Oh my god, four and a half stone? That's over 60 pounds in one year. Imagine if that pattern continues. What happened here? Well, if you look at what they eat, it's all processed junk. Spaghetti and tomato sauce, and like, it's plain spaghetti. No vegetables except for a few chunks of tomatoes. Did they eat a salad before this? Did they have any fruit? Did they have any organ meats or something? All you can really see Pavia eating in this documentary is junk food like ice cream, gummy bears, and soda. Which leads to this. Pavia doesn't seem to have an off button. She does always seem to be hungry. Of course she can't stop eating. She's eating a bunch of super addictive crap. Now allow me to tell you a personal story. I eat fast food on very rare occasions, mostly because I don't really like it. Anyway, the other day I had fast food for the first time in a while. I think it was like a 900 calorie meal. After that meal, all I could think of for around 4-5 to five hours was eating more food, which is not the case with normal food. When you eat stuff with high fructose corn syrup, heavily processed oils, lots of salt, or whatever other addictive substances they put in highly processed foods, that stuff makes you want to eat constantly. It's one of the reasons why removing processed foods from your diet and moving more towards cooking your own meals is so important for weight loss. Cooking your own food is not so much about the calorie count, it's more about being able to control what's in your food so you aren't drugged into constantly feeling the need to eat. But all of this begs the question that I asked in the beginning. How does Pavia afford all this food? Can I have a double ripple tail, please? Thank you. What's in there? What did you, what did you buy today? I uh, bought chicken tikka sandwich. Uh, my crisps. Haribo's a double decker and a drink, but I'm saving the double decker for later and the Haribo's. So. If you don't give her money, then she can't buy food. Easy weight loss program. Now, it would be wonderful if it was all that simple, but the reality is that Pavia's mom is also overweight. So what will happen is the mom will tell her daughter to lose weight and it comes off as quite hypocritical because the mom is obese as well like in the My 600 Pound Life video that I did. Maya's mom was morbidly obese, while at the same time she was telling her daughter to lose weight because she was more morbidly obese? Being around someone who has worse problems than you doesn't make your problem go away. They both needed to lose weight. So what will happen in this kind of situation where the parent also has a weight problem is the mom will say lose weight, she'll plan the meals and cook something healthy, but then she'll buy snacks and junk food for herself, which the kids will find and eat. Here's a different kid from the documentary describing that. Sarah's mum, Casimir, works nights as a contract cleaner. So every evening she leaves her daughter in the care of her older sister and with the run of the house. In my mum's secret cupboard, we have chocolate, crisps, caramels, candy, lollipops, every sweet thing in the world. This girl's mom wants her to lose weight, yet the mom fills the house up with junk food in a not-so-secret pantry and the kid loots it when the mom goes to work to which she must know her kid's doing that because the food is missing. That's her cue to stop buying junk food. But of course, the mom blames the food instead of herself, which is almost a requirement of this lifestyle because if she wasn't in denial, then her daughter wouldn't have a weight problem. So give me an idea of what you think's responsible for her weight. Well, it's, 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 it's school meal, yeah. That's why... I'm, school meals? Yeah, that's why, I, yeah, yeah. And what about any snacking? She likes crisps, she likes chocolate. Especially when I'm not home, yeah. she finds a place wherever I hide it, she's found it the place and she is. Of course. If you don't buy it, if it's mm. not in the cupboard, yeah. she can't find it. Right. Stop buying your kid a mountain of junk food. You have the control. And as a warning, if you don't teach your kids to control their behavior when they're young, then they'll grow up with all kinds of psychological problems. In the next segment, we can see Pavia's mom taking her to the clinic to get a checkup and some counseling on her weight issues. During this meeting, you can immediately see another big part of the problem in the medical industry, which is that many of the healthcare professionals are terrible at communicating to their clients. Do you know why you're here, Pavia? Not really. Um, 
Mm. Yeah. You, might, you might have a little clue. You can usually gauge quite quickly whether you're going to have a productive uh, consultation or not. Okay, so we have another iPad kid, and you can see Pavia is immediately checked out, followed by the doctor just giving up on her by suggesting in the post-interview that he knew this meeting wasn't going to be productive. From a professional perspective, this is the doctor's fault because he is obviously not training himself in communication techniques that will get his patients to listen. I know Pavia is on her phone here, but this guy's not even trying to make eye contact with her. He is instead nervously looking at his binder. Come on, man. This is your profession. Also, here's the thing. I've said before that I talk to a lot of people about how to be successful in creative fields. Most of the time when I'm doing these talks, it's not about whether or not I have the right information. I know I have the right information because I have the YouTube data to back it up. Most of my job helping people is actually catered towards convincing them that what I tell them will get them what they want. Though I can't entirely blame them, I work the same way as well. A while ago, I hired a Japanese teacher. She said, do this if you want to be fluent. I said no and proceeded to not improve for several months. Then I finally did what she told me to do and said, oh my God, you were right. I should have done what you said from the start. Understand that when you're trying to teach people things, you need to spend time convincing them that what you say will work or they will not listen to you. The way you do that is a little indirect. First, if you're trying to convince someone to lose weight, it's a good idea to not be overweight yourself. Because if you are overweight, what do you know? That's why Pavia won't listen to her mom. Second, don't do what her mom does here. You're obviously here because of your weight. Yeah. And it's not just a little bit high, it's very, very high. That's distracting with that phone. Can you just put the phone away, please? I'm not wasting any more time with this. Right, anyway. That was super awkward. Obviously, Pavia doesn't want to be there, and all the doctor does is state information that Pavia has probably had other people tell her a million times. Worse, Claire had to forcefully take away Pavia's phone, which is only going to piss her off and further make it so she doesn't listen. In that situation, the goal is to get Pavia to voluntarily put down her phone. So how do you do that? Well, you need to show the person that you care. Instead of starting out the conversation with, obviously you know why you're here, say, Hi Pavia, how are you? Why have you come to see me today? Whatever she answers, you make the conversation all about her and what she wants, because if you don't know what a person wants, then you won't be able to convince them to change their behavior. People only really change their behavior for two reasons to get something they want, or to avoid something they're afraid of. Proper influencing should include both. But you can just see that neither the doctor or the mom have considered Pavia's interests, because the whole conversation is about them and not her. She's obviously bigger than me. <laughs> it's, yeah. It is hard at home. It's very hard at home. No, I, 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 want, I, I, you know, I desperately want to help. But... How do you think we could help you, Pavia? Mm. Of course she's going to be dismissive and not answer that question. Help her with what? You haven't asked her what she wants help with. She might not even be able to articulate what she wants all that well because no one has asked her. So she might be missing crucial communication skills. Also, like I said, the real problem here is that this doctor completely has the right advice but is unable to get her to listen. Your weight is... I think there's one thing with having... being overweight and another thing with the weight still continue to go up rapidly. I think the first step is always to keep the weight the same. Have the motivation to do that. And then after that, just start getting it down. Yes, as a person who was formerly in the fitness industry, this is exactly what I would say to someone in Pavia's situation. First, we need to get you to the point where you aren't gaining weight. And after, we can focus on losing weight. You always want to achieve big goals with small steps but she's not going to listen to that because they haven't framed it to cater to something that she wants. Influencing someone to change is a mixture of knowing what the person wants and telling them how what you're saying will get them what they want. And it turns out that Pavia actually is aware of some of her desires. She'll just nag on about how my weight worries her. I'm like, yeah, okay, you don't need to keep saying it every four seconds of my life. You don't see me nagging on at her about her weight, do you? To be honest, I think school's more important than health and weight because I'd rather be an overweight with a job and a good house and things than be an overweight tramp, if you know what I mean. 
Okay, so now we know what Pavia values. She values not being a loser. Now, we don't have this information, but if I were talking to her, I would also ask her why she values not being a loser. Who's she trying to not be like? Because then, not only do I know what she wants, I know what she fears. I can use that information to better guide her to where she wants to go. Plus, her revealing what she fears is an indicator that she trusts you, which means she's more likely to listen. So based on this information, I need to talk to her about how losing weight will lead her to success. First, I would start off by saying that these things aren't mutually exclusive. You can be a healthy weight and be successful at the same time. It doesn't need to be one or the other. In fact, healthy habits are actually a component of success because tons of people who could have been successful become complete losers because they are a victim to their bad behaviors. If you want financial success, then it's going to be very hard to save up money or invest if you're spending all of your money on junk food, particularly if you add other expensive habits to that like smoking and drinking. Usually addicts have multiple addictions, so having multiple expensive bad habits is likely. Learning how to discipline your spending habits from learning how to discipline your calorie intake is very useful for success later in life. That's the kind of energy you want when you're trying to convince people, and the good news is that there are people in this documentary who are aware of that. Near Leeds, Claire's meeting Paul Gately, an expert on obesity in children from outside the NHS. Did you hear that? He works outside of the government-subsidized healthcare system in the UK. I thought that was interesting. Anyway, here's Paul having a sit-down talk with Pavia over a meal. School all right? You enjoy school? Sometimes. What bitch do you enjoy? Science. And? History. Right. What else? The dinner hall. <laughs> Very good. He's asking her about the things that she values. This is the key difference between Paul and the doctor who consulted with her at the obesity clinic. You can also notice that he's putting in a much greater effort to make eye contact with Pavia than the doctor did. Now, you can still see that Pavia is quite pissy and dismissive, but she's actually answering questions here, so we've made progress. She has a serious problem with anger and looks mad this entire documentary, so later they'll need to address why she's so angry all the time but only after they have built trust. So she's not just suffering with issues of her weight, she also has mental health issues, which really is always the case with obesity. So your mum said to help you with your weight, do you think you need any help? No. Well, that wasn't a very convincing no. Well, how do you make a no more convincing? Is it okay if I chat to your mum about it? You can, but I don't want to talk to her about it. Again, very good. Paul is testing the waters here and asking questions about what Pavia feels is acceptable behavior, so he knows more about how she likes to be treated and what her boundaries are. Knowing this information allows Paul to behave in a more desirable way, which will cause Pavia to respect him. Influencing 101, by the way, people will not listen to you if they don't respect you. This is not shown, but Paul has clearly already earned the respect of Pavia's mom, so when he gives Claire advice, she listens. The chances of her changing her weight trajectory are really low. Okay. 90% of kids who become obese don't change that. That's almost like saying she's got no hope. That's the reality of most circumstances for teenagers. It makes me feel a bit of a shit parent, to be fair. Unlike Pavia, you can see that Clara's making eye contact, is attentive, and even gets emotional after something Paul says. This means that she is listening and willing to be influenced. Also, notice that Paul is using fear as a motivator here by telling Clara the reality of her situation. And quick side note, obviously I mean use fear as a motivator in proper moderation. On the negative end, fear-mongering is unacceptable, and on the positive end, giving people false hope as a motivator is not acceptable either. Now, it's hard to hear what Claire says in this clip, at least for me because I'm an American, so I had to listen to this part multiple times to figure out what she was saying. That's why it's subtitled. But she says, it makes me feel like I'm a shit parent. This is Claire taking responsibility for how Poppy has turned out, and it's a pretty key difference between her and Natalie's behavior with her four-year-old daughter, which was much more of a result of her being lazy. Natalie knew what the right thing to do was, but she refused to do it because it was too hard. Whereas with Claire, it seems like her daughter Pavia's weight really bothers her, and she's willing to put the work in, but she simply doesn't know what to do. Anyway, next Claire takes Paul's advice from that previous clip, which was a conversation about boundaries, and then goes to have a talk with Pavia to set those boundaries. 
in this conversation, you can see that unfortunately, Pavia has zero respect for her mother and listens to nothing. I would like just to put the laptop down. I'm kind of busy, so... I know, darling, but I would like you to put the laptop down, please. No, because it keeps my knees warm. Yeah, either put it down whilst I'm talking to you or you'll lose it altogether. I can listen to you. I'm not stupid. So I can understand what you're saying whilst I'm on this. OK, put it down now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you can really see the difference between Claire and the lazy mom Natalie in this scene. You can see on her face that Claire realizes that she's screwed up in parenting when her daughter treats her like this. So on a positive note, because Claire is admitting fault here, this situation is very likely to improve. Now personally, I would not have done this conversation this way. Claire doesn't have the power to set those boundaries that Paul suggested, so she needs to build that before she can start making demands. The most obvious thing she can do to gain power and build respect is lose weight. It looks like she had started on that during the documentary, but she needs to be thin for a while before respect from her daughter will build. Second, she can set boundaries indirectly by refusing to buy or cook unhealthy food for her daughter. That's a nice little cheat code because it allows her to set a boundary without her daughter having to do anything, which means Pavia can't reject this kind of boundary like she did with the other ones. So first and foremost, I want to get your sleep pattern sorted out so that you're not up all night relying on energy drinks and stuff through the day. I don't want you eating in your room anymore just not acceptable. Well, maybe I don't want to start sitting at the table just because somebody said I have to. Did you catch what she said here? Maybe I don't want to sit at a table just because someone said I have to. She's telling her mom how to influence her. Pavia is correct. She shouldn't have to sit at the table just because someone said so. She should be sitting at that table because someone is making it enjoyable for her to be there. So being more enjoyable to be around is something that Claire needs to work on. You can notice this stuff if you just pay attention to what people say and watch their behaviors. Pavia gave her mom the answer to get her to sit at the table. Also relevant to this scene, generally when you're trying to influence people, you want to give them as few things to do as possible. All big and meaningful changes start with small steps towards the goal, which means any boundary change you request of someone should be very small and honestly, you should be doing most of the work to make the boundary change happen at the start. This is not directly related, but I think it helps with a metaphor. If we are talking about living with roommates and your roommate does something that pisses you off, the ideal situation is that your roommate does his best to not do the thing that pisses you off, while at the same time, you try not to get so pissed off when he does that thing. The change happens when both of you work together. You can't just make demands of people. You also have to put the effort in. Third, better handling of situations like this will help. Claire planned to have a sit-down family lunch, complete with Betty, her mother, and her new partner, Michael. I'm full. <laughs> You're full? What have you had to eat before? Having to make yourself full? Well, ice cream. Please, may I leave? Already? Yeah. If yeah. you're done, you're done. And then don't make me stay. Because I'm not hungry anymore. Okay. Bye. In this situation, Claire needs to take the loss and accept that she failed to get her daughter to eat properly without snacking on unhealthy food. But she can still salvage it by getting Pavia to stay at the table. Instead of bullying Pavia by saying, Why are you full? What junk did you eat? Ask her, well, even though you're full, can you stay and chat with us for a few minutes before you go upstairs? Tell us about your day. Listen to the boundaries that Pavia set earlier. She doesn't like people constantly bringing up her weight. So if you can steer the conversation away from that, then you can get her to sit down and have lunch with you for at least a few minutes longer than she would have. That's a big deal. Pavia is really lost during this documentary. Claire needs to be taking any small victory that she can get. I think she gets frustrated because she expects her daughter to start fixing her weight problem immediately, when the reality is that it's probably going to take six months of relationship building before Pavia is ready to even consider making a strong effort to lose weight. I think Claire's behavior during lunch more so describes everyone's ignorance about difficult situations like these. In the end, it looks like the obesity expert Paul was able to work this situation out well enough to get Pavia to stop gaining weight, which is a good start. I'm not really worried about my size at the moment because I do lots of exercise and stuff, so it should go away pretty quickly. What you want after this is a move towards losing one to two pounds per week, which will put her at a proper weight in about a year or two. Yes, proper weight loss does take that long. You can either do it correctly or yo-yo diet for a bunch of years and end up never losing weight. So if you want to be influential, you really have to be patient and bide your time until you have the person's respect. 
A part of gaining people's respect is having things that they want. It could be that you're really in shape. It could be that you have lots of friends or a good network. It could be that you've accomplished something difficult. You could be super knowledgeable in a field they want to know about. Or it could be really simple, like having a lot of money. Notice that Paul from the documentary is thin. That's a part of the reason why Claire listens to what he says. Understand that all of this is going to require hard work because influencing people is very difficult. But if you want to help people and make the world better, that's what it takes. It's a lot more than simply telling people what to do. Anyway, thanks for watching, follow me on Twitter, and I'll see you in the next video.